everyone to most uh, science and law panel. Um, I'm very excited that everyone could join. And uh, while we get started here, I'll just do a couple of housekeeping things and introductions, and then we will get into the information. It's gonna be really, uh, really fun. So um, uh, first off, um, we do have live captioning as an option available on Zoom. Um, if you need that, uh, you should be able to go to the bottom of your screen and turn that on. Uh, secondly, uh, feel free to enter your questions at any time uh, in the Q&A, which we'll be monitoring um, and uh, trying to answer that or answering um, during the panel. And finally, uh, we'll also be, this is being recorded and it will be available on the most website later. Um, so if you have to leave early or if you want to share it with others, it will be available. Um, Next, I just wanted to mention some other events. Um, so most policy initiative has another event on uh, a series of workshops on making the most of your science and using your expertise for civic engagement. Uh, that's gonna be in April, uh, which is a three part series, April 16th, 23rd and 30th uh, from 12 to 1.30 PM. So if you're interested, you can find that information on our website. Uh, it should be really engaging, especially for um, early career people. And then our uh, sister organization, the Missouri Local Science Engagement Network, has a series of events. Um, every week we have uh, YouTube, Facebook Live updates on the Missouri legislature. Uh, that's Fridays at 3 p.m. And then every month we have a science roundtable with different experts around the state. Uh, this month, we're going to be talking about vaccines in Missouri and specifically the push for the equitable uh, distribution of vaccines. So it should be uh, a hot topic. And that will be April 30th at 3 p.m. I'm going to close out of this and put some of those links in the chat. And then we'll get on with the panel. So. Oh, I got to stop share. <laughs> Okay, so in the chat, you can find some links about uh, signing up for future events, as well as more information on um, some of the organizations that the panelists are on. So I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists um, and then uh, have them introduce themselves a little bit, and then we will move into some of our questions um, on this topic. So to start off, we have Elizabeth Hubert. Um, who is the director of the Washington University Interdisciplinary Environmental Clinic, which um, uh, is also where Peter Good is affiliated with. And this clinic functions as a pro bono law practice handling environmental and community health cases. And it really is interdisciplinary um, and they tackle all kinds of challenges uh, with waste, uh, air, water, climate change, energy justice, um, so I highly recommend you check that out if you're interested in any kind of environmental topic. Um, uh, like I said, um, Elizabeth is, is the director. She's an accomplished litigator. Uh, she teaches and supervises law students. And uh, she holds a bachelor's from Wheaton, a master's from Northwestern, and a JD from University of Virginia. Uh, next, we have Peter Good, who is a lecturer in law and environmental engineer at Washington University. Uh, he's a registered engineer in Missouri and a graduate of Mizzou, and uh, also, interestingly, he previously worked at the Missouri Department of Natural Resources as the chief of the engineering section for the Water Pollution Control Program. He's also a policy analyst for the water protection and soil conservation, and uh, an environmental engineer uh, in different capacities for the Air Pollution Control Program. So uh, hopefully we'll hear some insights on the regula regulatory side of things. And um, finally, we have Rachel Wester, who is a Nebraska managing attorney from the Midwest Innocence Project. Uh, if you don't know about the, the Innocence Project, there's a link there in the chat. Uh, they do very important work uh, with helping people who have been wrongfully convicted. Um, and you can find some really good information on that. And uh, we'll 
definitely be talking a little bit more about that in the panel. Um, Rachel uh, has uh, previously earned a degree in speech communication and political science from Columbia College and her JD uh, also from University of Virginia. So uh, I'm very really excited to have all these panelists here and um, I'll have you start with a little bit more uh, introducing yourselves and I'll have uh, Liz start because uh, we have some slides. Let me get set up here. Uh... Okay, I think you can see where I'm going. So I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's, um, that's Ruby Rachel's toes here. But since I'm a lawyer, I was gonna talk about um, sort of the official way that uh, scientists and engineers and other technical people interact with the legal system as testifying expert witnesses. I mean, that's what you think of when you think of expert witnesses usually. The people who go to court, there's a jury there or there's a judge there and explain what's going on to the jury or the judge using their scientific or technical background. So that's kind of the really specific way. Um, I'm an environmental lawyer now, but before that, before this, I was a lot of other different kinds of lawyers. So I've had experience with a lot of different kinds of expert witnesses, um, financial experts, um, experts in other types of engineering. We've had a lot of product uh, liability cases when I worked in um, a personal injury firm. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of those, but I basically just wanted to kind of set the scene for you. And then Peter's gonna talk a little bit more about what we do in the clinic and how we um, use experts specifically. So what does an expert do? Uh, in federal court, it's rule 702 and each state has their own version of what an expert is. And it's anybody who has scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge that will assist the trier of fact. So that's the official language. So um, the trier of fact can be a jury or it can be a judge, depending on what kind of case it is. So it's anything that might be too complicated for a jury or a judge to understand. And keep in mind that most judges um, did not go to, don't have PhDs in the sciences or PhDs in any um, type of background. They would only have a JD and depending who, it depends who's on your jury, you might have PhDs in the relevant topic on your jury, although probably not because one side or the other would make sure that didn't happen. But usually they are what um, lawyers call lay people, meaning that they don't have either specific legal knowledge or specific scientific knowledge necessary to the case. So when you say, does it assist the trier of fact? It's any kind of case that has any kind of technical question in it that's not really easily understood by somebody who doesn't have a background in it. So what kinds of things are we talking about? So before you can have an expert, you have to have there has to be sufficient facts and data for an expert, whether technical or scientific, to form an opinion. In other words, there has to be enough facts developed in the case. If you don't know enough, then there's not enough for an expert to issue an expert opinion on. There has to be reliable principles or methods used in the field. And that's why I've got tarot cards up here. Uh, it's, believe it or not, a very complicated field. It has its own norms, its own guides, lots of rules. Everybody lays the cards out the same way. Not a scientific discipline, not the subject of expert testimony. And um, they also have to be able to be replied reliably in the case. So most scientific disciplines satisfy all three of those whether it's um, some kind of biology or biochemistry, whether it's some kind of engineering, whether it's some kind of basic physics, um, psychology, and some of the softer sciences count as well. Um, for example, uh, let's see, a sci uh, there's one particular subset of psychology that I saw a lot in products cases, and those are people who design, it's now called user interface, but back then it used to be called human factors engineering. And they're people who design products to be used by people. And uh, they go, there's um, 
a whole field of psychology or kind of psychology and engineering devoted to this, but it's things like how do you make products so that people won't injure themselves while they're using them? And this is something that seems like it ought to be really logical and that a jury would be able to figure it out on its own, but not necessarily. So that's kind of the gamut of things that you could be an expert in. And um, probably the easiest way to understand how an expert would interact with a jury or with a judge would be in a medical malpractice case. And we're gonna obviously hear about a lot of other different types of things, but um, that's a case against a doctor where you as the plaintiff think that the doctor has done something wrong in treating you or treating your loved one as the case may be. So if you wanna bring that kind of a case in a court, you're gonna to have to show that the doctor violated what lawyers call the standard of care. In other words, did something that wasn't as careful as most doctors would do. Obviously, some of them are really pretty understandable. Amputating the wrong leg is pretty understandable as something that most careful doctors don't do. But most things in the field require the testimony of a doctor, the expert testimony of a doctor to say what the doctor in the case did wrong. In other words, regular doctors would do it, normal doctors exercising careful, not negligent doctors would do it this way in this situation. The doctor who's the defendant in this case didn't do it that way. Therefore, that doctor was negligent or committed medical malpractice. The gist of it provided below par care to you as a, or your loved one as a patient. So only another doctor can say what the doctor did wrong. And the doctor who's on trial will also have a doctor to say, no, what they did, they did correctly because um, in fact, when doctors are faced with this situation, here's what they do. And um, that's the way that medical malpractice cases usually go. The testimony is really essential to understanding what went wrong in the case. And it's usually left up to the jury, usually a jury, sometimes a judge, to decide which of the two experts best explained what was going on, which of that was more grounded in science as they've explained it, which of them was more reliable, which of them was more credible. So um, this is one of the reasons people complain about defensive medicine, because sometimes you end up in a situation as a doctor where you're thinking about malpractice and you're like, I'm going to go ahead and order that test because I don't want to be defending not ordering that test in court. Uh, it works this way for all professions. Pretty much every expert I've worked with has complained about, who's a professional has complained about having to do things that because they're worried about what some lawyer on down the road is going to say about them. So why would you have an expert witness testify um, in medical malpractice cases? Because you have to. Sometimes it's written into the law itself that says you need to have a doctor testify but usually it's because you want someone to explain complicated issues that have to do with what's going on in the case. So if it's a product and you're claiming that the product malfunctioned or didn't malfunction, you're gonna need some kind of an expert, could be a structural engineer, could be pretty much anything else, including the sort of user interface people that I've talked about to explain what went wrong or what went right. Uh, expert witnesses can testify about things that other witnesses can't. Uh, because they're experts, they're able to form opinions about whether what happened was uh, a violation of the standard of care or a violation of the law or not in a way that other witnesses can't. If you're just somebody who witnessed a car accident, you, can't, you don't have the knowledge to be able to testify about whether the structural steel in the car failed or not. That's something that an expert who's had years of experience and training and study can testify about and say, yeah, it's my opinion based on what I know about cars, what I know about um, the way that metals work, that this failed or that this didn't fail. So they're important to have on your case. And um, they can also rebut witnesses from the other side. So if you think about it, in most cases, there are going to be one expert for one side and another expert from the other side. It doesn't really matter which side is which. And the court and the juries have to figure out which expert is the expert that they're going to rely on. 
So what do lawyers do with, um, with expert witnesses? So if you're looking at the other side, you pick your expert because you think they're going to be um, credible. You think the jury's going to like them and trust them because they have adequate knowledge, because they have adequate science, because they're experts in a field that's important and closely related to what's going on in the case, uh, because they can communicate well, because they can explain the bases for their facts. And that's why you pick an expert. When you're taking apart the other side's expert, you undo every one of those things. You want to show that their expert's not credible, that they're relying on facts and data that they shouldn't have considered that they don't have the evidence to support their claims, that they're not really qualified to give their opinion. Um, and the, in federal court, at least, there's a report that helps you figure all of this out. Um, if you are an expert witness, you have to provide a report that it says, here's my opinion, here's the basis for my opinion, here's why I'm qualified to give this, and goes into a little bit about whether you are just a hack who always testifies one way in every single case, or whether you are a scientist whose um, opinions are really worth something. You have to talk about whether or not you're paid. Expert witnesses are um, almost always paid and it can be very expensive if you're in the position of um, a party to the case. But um, the, all of that information is in the expert report. You want your expert, if you're uh, a lawyer representing a party to provide a, an airtight, uh, convincing report, and your job as the lawyer for that party is to attack the other side's expert um, and, and, and in, any way in any way possible that you can think of. Um, sometimes it gets to be ridiculous. I mean, I used to practice in Alabama, and there is this Auburn-Alabama football rivalry, and lawyers would seriously pick on experts who were for the wrong team. You know, I'm sorry, he went to Auburn. How could you possibly trust an Auburn experts when we're all Alabama fans here? So it gets to be a little bit ridiculous. And this is the battle of the experts that, we're, that you've heard people talk about. But um, when all goes well, it should rely on science rather than affiliation with one university or another in the state. And it should be who tells the most convincing scientific story that explains the law and the cases and what actually happened in the case. And if you are a good expert, you will be able to do that in a way that the jury will be able to understand. And when they're back in the room deliberating about who should we rule for, they'll be able to remember your testimony, understand what's going on with it and make a ruling accordingly. So that's kind of the uh, basics behind experts. And now I'm going to turn it over to Peter to talk a little bit more about um, what experts, um, what we do with experts in our clinic. Okay, thanks, Liz. Um, um, again, I'm I work with Liz. Um, we're a, a legal clinic within a law within the law school of Washington University, but I'm an environmental engineer, and um, I'm kind of like the in-house technical assistance for, for the legal clinic. Um, we have another person, uh, we have another attorney in our clinic, and we also have another person who's an environmental scientist. So we're, we're unique. Um, we're the only um, legal clinic in the country that I'm aware of that has in-house technical expertise. Um, so that's kind of our, you know, interdisciplinary is kind of our specific model and it's, it's fairly unique. Um, um, but Liz has kind of set up, you know, what, how the process works for um, testifying experts, um, but in in our clinic, um, you know, we we our issues revolve around the environment and protection of, of public health, and most of our clients are either nonprofit environmental organizations or citizens um, who are concerned about a specific public health issue, grassroots groups. So they're not they're not industry businesses. Um, uh, folks like that. Um, so we have a very specific type of, of client and um, we operate in a very kind of specific area. Um, but one of the ways that we use, use experts um, is in a consulting capacity. 
Um, and this is because our the work that we do often revolves around administrative processes that um, aren't quite to aren't to the point of litigation yet. So, as an example, I'll use say a um, an industrial facility that has a wastewater discharge to one of the large rivers in Missouri, say the Missouri or the Mississippi rivers. Um, if it has that wastewater discharge, it has to have a permit under the Clean Water Act. So um, when a permit is, is issued to a, an industrial facility, it has to first be put on public notice so that the public has an opportunity to uh, provide input or comment on what the government is proposing the, this indus industrial facility to discharge into um, a water of the United States. So um, during that process, um, during that public participation process, um, you know, an environmental group or a group of citizens might come to us and say, hey, we're concerned about this facility. It discharges industrial wastewater, what's going on? And we can kind of tell, give them an idea because of our in-house expertise of, you know, what to expect that's coming out of the pipe that's going in, into the river and explain what's, what's in the permit. Um, but one of the things that we often don't necessarily have the expertise to do is to explain what is, or to know what is the impact on say the aquatic life in, in the river specifically. So we may have, um, in the one example I'm, I'm, I'm most familiar with, we we were looking at um, this type of industrial discharge and we had, a, there was a, an aquatic life study on um, this, this large river and it was over a couple of years, um, there were people that went out and collected various fish species um, using different methods throughout different times of the year, looking at various life stages of those species and um, what their kind of like overall population was throughout the, the, the several years that this study was, was conducted. So what we wanted to know was, was, would this industrial discharge have any impact? Was it having any impact on the aquatic life? So while my expertise um, in aquatic life um, was mostly during my 20s when I had a very serious um, fishing addiction. I used to love to go fishing all the time. I knew how to bait a hook. I knew the difference between a largemouth bass and a smallmouth bass and a rock bass. That didn't quite cut it when it came to looking at impacts of industrial discharges on aquatic life in a large ecosystem like um, the Missouri or the Mississippi rivers. So um, we enlisted the help of an expert. And um, at this point in the process, we weren't look necessarily looking at going into court but we needed somebody to help us interpret all of this data. So we could do a lot of the groundwork and legwork ourselves, like collecting the data, compiling it, summarizing it, um, and then having, having our expert look at us, look at it and tell, interpret it for us so that we could form an opinion on as to whether or not this discharge was impacting uh, the aquatic life in this river. So we were able to work with, um, um, are the expert, um, they could ask us questions, they could ask us to try to find more data. Um, and because the, the, uh, the person that we worked with was, was an academic, they were less familiar with the regulatory requirements. So we can take what they tell us and kind of fit it into what the regulatory requirements were and see if there was, if there was a problem with this permit that was being issued. If so, we inform our clients, they tell us, you know, hey, we need to notify the agency that there's a problem here, um, write up some comments for us and, and submit those to the agency. So that's one way in we, which we use an expert that's not necessarily litigation related, um, but it does require some expertise. It does require a lot of the similar things that you would for a testifying expert. In other words, there has to be some confident, confidentiality um, there may need to be some compensation for the expert's time, um, uh, things of that nature. Um, but that's, that's one way we use an expert that's not, not a testifying expert. Now, that process, that administrative process may continue such 
uh, further on down the road where our client may, um, whatever the administrative agency's decision is, our client may say, hey, we don't like that decision. They didn't do what they should have. We say, yes, in fact, what they did, we think we did, they did it is, is not legal. We could file suit and appeal that and appeal that permit. Then our consulting expert, should they um, uh, decide that they want to continue on, then they could become a testifying expert for us in, in, in actual litigation. But they can also bow out at that point and say, no, thank you. Um, it takes quite, it's quite a, a time commitment to be a, um, a testifying expert. Um, and um, we've had consulting experts that have been extremely helpful in the past, but have told us told us right up front that I've been a, a testifying expert before, never again will I do that. And these are mostly people that work in academia that um, are not always, but a lot of times volunteering their time, um, but it does require a, a significant time commitment. Um, as Liz has already explained um, how uh, testifying experts work, so I'm not going to get into, into any detail on that, but suffice to say, we do hire, we do um, use testifying experts when our clients decide that they want to take that next step and get, in, get into litigation too. Um, and we do our work very closely with our, our testifying experts. Um, one thing I will say that if you're interested in being a, a testifying expert, um, you need to um, one be able to make make a significant time commitment, um, and two have a um, fairly uh, I would say thick skin about about your work and your expertise. Because one, you're, if you have a good attorney on your side, they should be constantly questioning what you're doing to make sure that um, your your test your reports and your testimony are very airtight and can be defended. So you're going to get lots of questions from your your own attorney, as well as your opposition's your adverse party as well too. They will try to um, um, uh, make you out to not be an expert as well too. So having a little bit of a thick skin, being confident in your own work, is something that definitely um, is necessary if you want to be a testifying testifying um, expert. Um, so um, I'll kind of stop there, and I guess pass it off to Rachel. Sure, so I'll give a little bit of background um, about MIT and then how our work interacts with science um, and how expert witnesses play a role in that. So um, as Jenny indicated, I'm an attorney at the Midwest Innocence Project. We're a nonprofit organization. Um, we're located in Kansas City, but we work in a five state area, Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and Arkansas. And we work to um, investigate and litigate and um, to exonerate the wrongfully convicted in that five state area. Um, so there have been, across the country since 1989, there have been, I checked today, there have been 2,775 exonerations. Um, we split that number into exonerations that have happened because of DNA testing, because of advances in DNA technology, um, and then exonerations that have happened for other reasons, because um, there's a new understanding in social science or a witness has recanted or um, we uncover official misconduct of some sort. Um, and so of that 2,700-ish total exonerations, about 375 of those cases are DNA exonerations, where DNA testing that was not available at the time of someone's trial or where the DNA technology has advanced um, in many ways, since the time of trial, we can now test evidence that was not tested before um, or wasn't tested as rigorously before. Um, and so we take on both those DNA cases and non-DNA cases. And so one big way that science comes into play with our cases is when we have a case where there's the ability to do DNA testing. Um, I've kind of indicated that DNA testing is an area where a lot of progress has been made in the last um, 10 to 20 years, and we can do tests um, that will give us a lot more specific results than we could back, back then. And we can also take smaller amounts of DNA and amplify that DNA um, and get results that we couldn't have got 20 years ago. Um, and so we will take on cases where there's the potential to do some sort of DNA testing. Um, but the non-DNA cases also involve science for us as well. So um, two of the biggest 
contributing factors to wrongful convictions are eyewitness misidentifications and false confessions. Um, and those are two areas of social science where there's been a ton of research and progress made in those two areas. We know a lot more now about what might make an eyewitness identification more or less reliable, what factors occurred during the ID, what happened after um, the crime and during the process um, where the witness is identifying someone in the police department that might make um, an ID more or less reliable. And same thing with false confession. We know a lot more about why someone might falsely confess the circumstances um, involved in a confession that might make someone more vulnerable to falsely confess. And so um, that's an area where social science interacts with our work. And then the last is um, forensic sciences. And we separate that from DNA. So there is a National Academy of Sciences report from 2009 that says, with the exception of DNA analysis, no forensic method has been rigorously shown to have the capacity to consistently and with a high degree of certainty demonstrate a connection between evidence and a specific individual or source. Um, and so we see a lot of cases come across our desk where there's been some sort of um, forensic science testimony involved in the case and where that testimony was flawed or misleading in some way. Um, flawed forensic science has played a role in almost a quarter of the total exonerations um, since 1989. It's a huge area of interest within um, our office and the Innocence Network at large. And so we're looking for cases where there was some sort of feature comparison science or future comparison discipline at issue, um, where an analyst is looking at two fingerprints and comparing them to um, bullets, to bite marks, to footwear impressions. Um, and again, this is an area where we know a lot more now than we did um, 20 years ago. And we know that analysts were getting on the stand and going too far in their testimony and saying that these two fingerprints matched to the exclusion of all other fingerprints or these two hairs matched to the exclusion of all other hairs. And we know now that that's not okay because there's no valid statistical basis to say that. There are no empirical studies that back up that conclusion. Um, and we have to leave room in that kind of testimony for uncertainty um, because we don't know anything about the error rates involved in those disciplines. And so that's another big area where science interacts with our work. Um, and so we use experts in all of those ways, we, um, we use experts to do the DNA testing. Um, if we're asking for that, we consult with social scientists if we have an issue like an eyewitness ID or a false confession. Um, and then we also use experts to consult with us about a forensic science issue if that comes up in a case. Um, and so we use experts, again, to test, to consult, and then also to testify in cases as well. So I'll leave it as, at that for now and turn it back over to Jenny if she has more questions. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. That was that was really helpful of a lot of different perspectives. Um, I'll invite any participants to put their questions in the Q&A or in the chat. But in the meantime, I will ask you some questions. And I wanted to follow up with Rachel uh, because, you know, I've been watching some of the stuff that comes out from the Innocence Project for a while. And it's really fascinating to me because, uh, you know, I was trained as a scientist and we have a particular way of, you know, making sure uh, that we're in within a certain range of certainty or quantifying that. And, um, you know, a lot of people, they get exposed to the idea of forensic science from shows like CSI or NCIS. And they have this idea that it's this really big, fancy technical thing, but then what, what is actually happening is sometimes it's, it's really not. And um, I think the case, the, the issues that you're talking about, like with DNA testing, people could actually go back and test these hair samples that were supposed to be very high matches. And they could say like, actually now we can test and we can say no, and we can actually quantify that. And so the question I have um, for you and other panels can fill in too, is sort of more general is, you know, science and law operate on different timescales and have different ways of dealing with uncertainty. So how do you, um, you know, how do you handle those scientific uncertainties? And this probably comes up a lot, I would imagine, in, in, in environmental law too. 
how do you sort of teach experts to talk about that or how do you talk about that yourself? Yeah, um, so I kind of thought about this question as, um, you know, is the law catching up to science or science catching up to the law? Um, and I think the answer I came up with is that it's a little bit of both, right? Um, you know, we, as you said, Jenny, um, we're learning now that we don't have statistical basis for all these things that CSI or law and order would make people believe is a complete certain type of science. And that if there's a fingerprint analyst up there saying that a fingerprint matches, then that is the truth, right? And there's no room for error in that. And, and that's, um, that's incorrect. Um, and one thing that sort of was the impetus for this that I'll touch on a little bit is um, a review of hair comparison cases that was conducted by the FBI along with the Innocence Project and the National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. And what ended up happening was that in 2012, there were three men um, in the DC area who were exonerated in pretty short order. And all of them had had a hair comparison uh, in their case, where an analyst looked at their hair and not a hair from a crime scene and got on the stand and testified that those two hairs matched and then these men were convicted. And it turns out years later, we did DNA testing that wasn't available at the time of their trials and we learned that um, all of them were innocent and they were exonerated. And so this made the FBI look and think like, maybe there's some sort of bigger issue here, right? with the way that we've been talking about um, hair and feature comparison disciplines like hair. So the FBI took a look at around 1,500 cases where there had been this type of hair testimony, um, and they started doing DNA testing of those cases because now we can take that hair, and if it has a root on it, we can DNA test it, and we couldn't do that um, 20 years ago. And so they started trying to figure out in how many of these cases did we get it wrong? Um, or did the analysts get it wrong? And they found an error rate of over 95%, which is huge. So 26 of the 27 examiners that they looked at had made erroneous statements on the stand where they had gone too far in their testimony. They'd expressed certainty about a match, right? Um, and it turns out that they were wrong. Um, and so that was a big, I mean, that's, that's huge, right? That error rate is huge. And so that was a big impetus for, okay, is that same thing going on with other feature comparison disciplines like fingerprints or shoe prints or bite marks? And of course it is because it's the same issue, right? Um, where there's an analyst looking at two things under a microscope. We don't know the uniqueness of any of those things. We don't know whether a shoe print is unique or a fingerprint is unique in the same way that we know that DNA is. Um, and so, that's an issue and that's been a big focus of um, the criminal defense community and the innocence community. Um, and in that sense, you know, I think we're trying to get both the law and science to catch up <laughs> to where we are now. Um, so law-wise, we're trying to educate people about this issue, right? And in, in particular, jurors, because they are exposed to things like CSI and they think that if they see somebody up there um, testifying about a feature comparison discipline that it must mean that the person is guilty um, and that that's that the answer they're giving is correct um, and so we want to educate people about this we want to educate courts about this we want to figure out ways that we can use what we know about this new understanding we have of forensic science on our end to litigate cases where that's um, happened in someone's case um, and also there are scientists who are now kind of trying to like reverse engineer or go in on the back end and figure out what are the error rates, right? Like, can we do a black box scientific study where we can start determining what an error rate is for fingerprint examiners or ballistics examiners? Um, there is an organization at Iowa State University called CSAFE, the Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Science. Um, I'll put the link to their website in the chat because they're doing a ton of really incredible and interesting work where they're looking at, at these future comparison disciplines, even things like handwriting analysis, and trying to do empirical studies to determine error rates. Um, so I'll throw that in and take a look at their work because um, it's interesting and it, it sort of is a way where science is trying to catch up and at the same time that the law is trying to catch up too.
Yeah, and I can add a little bit, a little bit to that from my, um, well, I guess it counts as part of environmental, environmental law. One of the biggest issues with environmental contamination, say, is causation. And that's an area where there's almost always huge uncertainty. Uh, and it can be very difficult to, uh, I've done this on the plaintiff side, so the side's trying to prove that something caused someone's uh, illness or caused their injury. And it's there is a lot of education of both jurors and judges that needs to happen because science is inherently uncertain. I mean, there are very few things that are like 100%. And jurors, especially, and also judges, really do believe in the CSI model of if an expert says it, it's got to be true. So if you have an expert out there who's saying, well, I'm 95% sure, which is huge for science, uh, they're like, well, obviously you're not as good as the expert on CSI, you know, Las Vegas or whatever that I watched and uh, I don't believe you. So it's been um, huge. That's probably been the way I've seen these kind of issues play out the most is in trying to convince juries that, yes, this really did cause this. We can say with some certainty, but not 100% certainty because nobody is ever really that certain even when at, when jurors don't want to believe that they want to hear, um, yes, that's it. That's the only cause. And if you can't prove that, uh, we're not ruling in your favor. Okay, well, thank you for those perspectives. It's really helpful. Um, so we have a question uh, that uh, Rachel's reminding me to ask. Um, so how does something like an amicus brief fit in with this discussion of expert testimony? I'll say we've done, we've done some working with experts at the clinic. We did one that was in the US Supreme Court about um, how air uh, pollutants are transferred across state lines. And this is one where the court below, the court that was, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court was trying to decide whether they had gotten it right or not, really kind of didn't understand what the issues were and had an overly simplistic view of how air pollution works. The lower court thought of it as going from like one place into like one other state at a time, not realizing that at the same time it's going out, it might be going to a whole bunch of different states in different amounts, and that air pollution might be coming back to the state that the original source was in and that you have to sub add and subtract or well, all of these things make it a much tougher question than the court had um, conceived of it. And we had air modeling experts explain what they do and explain how you would go about making these determinations that you couldn't just say, okay, well, we're gonna divide it by three because it's going to three states and we want everything to be even that you, that didn't work, that there was a much more complicated way of doing it than that. And the way that EPA was looking at it in this case was correct. So um, these are these were all academics for the most part um, who were testifying really about um, and trying to explain it in a way that people like me, who are lawyers who don't have technical training and like the um, justices and the clerks on the US Supreme Court could understand and understand why um, we were unsatisfied with what the court below had done and why this was an overly simplistic way of doing it. These experts didn't have to testify. We worked with them though, they to write the brief in a way that um, would be understandable to regular people who don't know a lot about air modeling or air pollution transport across um, across the country. And it was a project, really a product of both legal and technical experts to be able to get it done. It went through lots and lots of drafts and um, in order, this is one that went, I like talking about because we won this one. We don't always win in environmental law, but this is one where we were able to convince the court that, yeah, the lower court got it wrong and you should, um, it should come out the other way. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to what Liz said that this is this is a great way for experts to get involved because it doesn't involve testifying. You don't get deposed. You can 
you know, use your expertise in kind of almost a pure way to explain a scientific principle or the way something works or explain a set of data. Um, and then you can, you get to learn from the experience because you get to work with the lawyers. And like Liz said, you're trying to put this in a way that is, you know, more in line with something that the, that the average person can understand, not something that's getting published in an academic journal. So you get to you get to kind of apply your knowledge and explain something um, in a way, and you don't have to worry about all the extra extra hassle of testifying or being deposed, um, things of that nature. So it's it's a great way to be um, to be a, to participate as an expert with all the without all the the difficult baggage that sometimes comes 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 along with. Okay, well, great. That's very helpful. Um, it sounds like a nice option. Um, so we have a lot of um, early career researchers in our audience, I believe. And there's a couple of questions I got to the chat um, related to sort of generally wh what sort of tips you have for scientists to be more helpful in how they communicate and communicate more clearly. And then also for someone who is, you know, interested in doing this, how do they build their credentials and, you know, sort of prove their expertise? Um, I, I don't go ahead and take a try at answering that one. So um, the best way to build your expertise is to do really good academic work. That's usually what um, lawyers are looking for in an expert is somebody who has uh, pursued truth to the, you know, the, the far, not like just been in the service of industry or in the service of one side or another, but somebody who's done really good work and uh, that made work that's advanced the field, you know, that then that's impressive when they come to court and they can really speak to with expertise about whatever the subject matter is, it's air modeling or anything else, they can answer all of the tough questions they're gonna get from the other side because you really know your subject and you've really done good work in it. So that's probably the best way. Um, putting yourself, it's, um, I'm trying to think of like the best way to say, put yourself in the way of becoming an expert. I mean, some of it really is just working, doing, having an academic career. When I look for experts, that's usually where I go. I like who's written on the field in this, who's regarded as an expert by other people in the field who have written on this. And then um, that's usually where we start when we start contacting potential experts. Yeah, I'll just add to what, to what Liz said. I think um, in terms of communication, I mean, it, it's simple, but you really do, especially if you're in front of a jury, you have to break down what is oftentimes a very complicated field or process um, into digestible pieces. Um, and I think to the extent possible, I think demonstratives or visual aids are a really great way to help with that when you're testifying in court. I watched a presentation years ago about DNA in particular about probabilistic genotyping. And this guy used a visual aid about reaching into a jar and pulling out a certain color of ball. And I've never forgotten that. Like that has stuck with me. It is the first thing that sort of clicked in my head of like, oh, now I get how this works. And I think, you know, lots of people are visual learners and to the extent you can use some sort of demonstrative or video, um, that is helpful to educate both jurors and the court about a topic they might not know about. Um, and the other thing I think is, you know, if you're really starting out being an expert, you might need to do some of your own outreach. You know, we get um, emails and I know other innocence projects do too, of people who say like, I've been researching eyewitness ID, you know, I haven't testified before, but I want to lend my services. And for the first couple of cases, maybe you do it pro bono or you do it at a low rate and you just get yourself out there um, and kind of get your feet wet. And I think that's, that's a good way um, to, to get in the field and get started. Yeah, I'll just, just to add on to that. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, uh, academia is a great way. Um, but if you already have spent some time in academia, you've got a master's degree or a PhD, 
um, and you're working in a specific field. We, we see lots of experts that have done consulting work um, who have worked for engineering firms, um, things along those lines. Um, and, you know, we've had, just as an example, we've had cases that involve landfills and um, experts that have worked in those cases are the best ones to, are the, I guess you'd say, the ones that seem to carry a lot of weight um, are those that have experience designing and operating landfills um, and the systems and the systems around them. So, I mean, to some extent, there's no there's no substitute for experience. So, if you you know if you have an advanced degree and you have done some some, but most of your work may be you know working in a specific industry or doing consulting work. Um, there are opportunities to be to be experts there as well too. It doesn't have to be mostly academia, um, because that that experience, you know, if you've if you've designed fifteen landfills in your lifetime, um, that's going to carry some weight with a, a jury or a judge, um, or you know, even if you're just testifying at a at say a public hearing, um, that'll carry some weight with you know the whatever agency is is the, making the decision in that proceeding. Thanks. Thank you for those responses. Very helpful. Kind of, kind of always makes me think of the movie My Cousin Vinny, but uh, yeah, not sure if that's the most accurate. I show that to my law students. Oh, good. <laughs> that's it's a really great example of how to qualify, how to show that your expert's an expert, and yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> um. We do have a question here from the Q&A. Um, I don't know if this applies to you guys, but um, has anyone worked with families and children in the legal systems? Um, I don't know if that's come up with your work, Rachel. Maybe not so much. Um, okay, and then... Um, So we talked about sort of giving testimony as an expert witness on the stand. We talked about the amicus brief and um, consulting. Are there any other ways that scientists and um, researchers might work within the legal system? Um, and potentially this could be to you, Peter, if this is more, it ends up more in regulatory side of things. Sure. So, like, like I said, there's there's a lot of things that can happen, especially in the in the work that we do. That's you know either prior to or just outside of um, the legal system. Like I said, there's lots of um, opportunities to testify at public hearings, at public meetings, before administrative decision makers. Um, here in Missouri, we have a jillion boards and commissions that oversee kind of everything that the the state oversees um you know oil and gas mining clean water clean air solid waste hazardous waste all these sorts of things um so there's lots of opportunities to testify before those type of of, of boards and commissions um where you can use your expertise to help um form policy and regulation because a lot of the things that end up impacting people and um, business, et cetera, in Missouri are done at kind of at that level where regulations are made, where permits are, are issued. Um, and so there's, there's op opportunities when there's a new regulation before say the Missouri Clean Water Commission um, to testify at a hearing so that the commission can hear a certain perspective and um, they're always they're always interested in hearing from people that have specific, specific expertise in certain in, in in an area that they're that they work in. Um, they oftentimes hear from the regulatory regulated community and the public and environmental groups. Um, but a lot of times that that testimony is, um, for lack of better terms, is kind of somewhat devoid of. Um, facts sometimes 
Um, there's a lot of, I don't want this because it's in my backyard. There's a lot of, I, we want this because it's good for the economy. It's good for business. But then there's kind of this void on, you know, well, what are the true impacts on both people and business? Um, you know, and um, experts can kind of help fill, fill that gap of, of information. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you. And just a reminder, you can sign up if you're in Missouri for the Missouri Local Science Engagement Network if you want notifications about those opportunities to speak publicly. Um, and so we're getting close to the end of our time. So I just want to give everyone a chance to say any final thoughts that you have of, you know, what do you think the public should know about how science is used in the legal system? Or what do you think scientists should know? Um, so whoever wants to start. I can start. Um, I think one thing, you know, for the public is um, just in a greater understanding that, first of all, not every case has quality evidence and not every case is going to have um, DNA evidence or even a forensic science issue um, that can tell you very much. And to expect when those issues pop up, even with DNA, you know, there's um, contamination or interpretation involved in DNA results. Um, there's human factors that go into this. We talk a lot in our work about cognitive bias and the effect that that has on any type of um, examiner DNA or any other kind of feature comparison discipline. Um, you know, we're all human, right? And so if we get information about a suspect in relation to a certain case, we might look at results a certain way. Um, and so understanding that those human factors are involved and understanding that um, we should expect nuance and gray area um, and that science is gonna change and our understanding of it changes and we have to accept that change um, and be willing to accept it um, and be educated about it. And I think for, for scientists, I mean, I think being part of a scientific community that supports good science in the courtroom um, is really important. I think there's some self-regulation involved in that, or there should be self-regulation involved in that. And if you in any way are part of educating future scientists, I think there's a responsibility to be honest about the limitations um, of your particular field um, and where we can improve. Yeah, I would echo that too, that um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, bad science that happens in the courtroom. I mean, from what Rachel was talking about to just, um, there really are people whose opinions are for sale and you can get them to say pretty much anything you want them to, which is terrible. And uh, yeah, that's something I think that probably self-discipline or dis policing within the discipline can have some effect but it can also be crowded out uh, in a positive way by good science. I mean, when you, there, you have much more credibility than someone who is obviously just uh, offering any opinion possible. If you have a real opinion, even if you express doubts or uncertainties, um, it's usually pretty apparent who's really, you know, who's the real scientist in the, in the situation. But that is something I, mean, I encourage scientists to get involved as much as possible because bad science will take your place if you're not. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say that that's, that's very true. And like I mentioned earlier, there's, there's opportunities to be involved um, in using your science knowledge outside of the courtroom um, and take advantage of those opportunities um, where they come up, even if you're not, you know, testifying on behalf of an organization or a client or something like that, there's always opportunities to testify on your own behalf as a citizen in Missouri. Um, and that's a good way to, to get involved and practice some of your um, skills at, at you know, uh, presenting scientific information to people that otherwise don't, might not, might not be aware of the, of the information. It's, it's most definitely um, a good way to kind of get started. Um, and, you know, if you, if you, testify um, at a hearing or something like that. And there are people there that might want to employ you as, as a consulting expert, they will find you for sure. Um, so um, 
yeah, that's that's always a good way to to get started as well too. Um, one thing I one thing I've learned that surprised me is that one of the one of the ways that we could really use science is in one of the least least likely arenas in my, that I ever thought, and that is planning and zoning, which is a very very local thing. But science questions come up there all the time um, because the local governments are trying to regulate various things from stormwater to landfills to compost to whatever. So there's even a need for science experts at, at that level as well too. So you can, you can kind of find opportunities everywhere. Okay, well, thank you so much for being on the panel and telling us all that information. I think this has been really fun and I've learned a lot and thank you to everyone attending. Um, Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.